Um, oh, and Father Sal Ragusa too. So welcome, Sal. Good to have you. Um, Brother Mickey's with us uh, from uh, New Jersey, and uh, he told me that this is his third presentation today via Zoom. So uh, I owe him big time. Uh, and I'm and gonna remind you of that. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, just to let Mickey know, last weekend, we, uh, last Wednesday, we celebrated the feast of, uh, of uh, St. Mary Magdalene. And uh, I shared with them the legend of uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus uh, in that boat that went to Southern France and how uh, they landed in that Southern part of France, the most beautiful part of France and each went to its own area. And so we looked at Mary Magdalene, um, Marseille, and uh, the, the cave where she spent the last years of her life in prayer. And I was so happy that you're able to share with us, continue the legend with uh, the story of St. Martha on her feast day. So I wanna begin with the, an opening prayer, um, which is the prayer for uh, St. Martha's feast. I also ask, would ask your prayers, I just heard this evening, uh, that a little 10-year-old boy was hit by a truck mm. yesterday and died uh, from the accident mm. in Lafayette. Um, so let's uh, keep that uh, little one that the Lord might uh, take him into his arms and especially for his family uh, in this terrible time already to be grieving the loss of a little child uh, is an just added tragedy. So for him and them, let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, your son Jesus was pleased to be welcomed in St. Martha's house as a guest. Grant, we pray, that through her intercession, serving Christ faithfully in our brothers and sisters, we may merit to be received by you one day into the halls of heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Mickey, the floor Come is on. Yours. All right. Oops. Okay, here we are. Does everybody have the picture there? Yes. So, let me get rid of you all. I'm going to move you to the left here. Okay, is that good? Do you see the picture? Did I do that right? Okay. So tonight we're going to look at calming your dragons for the, uh, when John and I were talking last week and I realized it was the Feast of St. Martha, as he just said, we'll, we'll carry on with that. And it's a great time to, learn how to deal with some of our dragons. There are so many of them lurking out there these days. Huh? Well, I recently uh, discovered this quote from Pope Paul VI, who at uh, the closing of Vatican II made this statement to artists, to welcome artists back into the fold of the church because the uh, previous popes had condemned modern art and modernism in any form. And so um, he said, this world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. And I think these are truer than ever, these words and the thought behind them. And uh, that's what brings me here tonight. And uh, I hope in, with all my work that beauty fills our hearts with hope and joy, no matter how sad you may feel or fearful or whatever. We, we all have so much torment going on these days. And beauty is a real healing element, not just um, praying in the presence of beauty, uh, but to create beauty in your own little way. And so that's what we're going to uh, take a look at, how we, how we can go about doing that. Oop. Why isn't this forward button working? There we go. Um, so this is an image of uh, the Madonna and Child that I did before going to Africa several years ago and uh, to work on a mural project at an AIDS clinic. And before I went, I was doing a lot of, I had never been to Africa before, so I was doing things out of my imagination. But I always love this passage uh, that we hear from Isaiah every Advent about the, when the, uh, when the Christ comes into the world, the lion will lie down with the lamb and the, and the, the goat and the bear will be friends. And so about all of nature kind of coming together uh, in, the, in the name of one God, the creator and the healing process will begin. And all the things that seem polarized and opposite will become friendly. And it's just especially these days that it seems like such an important thought to have. But I'm, I put it in tonight because that lion tonight reminds me of the dragons that we're ready to look at and how we can sometimes symbolize uh, the, 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 
the fierceness of our fears and energies in in a in a form like that. I think my uh, forward buttons are acting up here. I don't know what that's about. Hold on. Okay. Um, so John mentioned the boat. Did you show this picture, John, last week when you? Not this you, you didn't have it. Okay. No. Well, uh, several years ago, my I, I ran a trip. Every September, I run trips. Many of you have been on them, and which is wonderful. And um, but this trip was to the southern France, and we landed in Nice. Spent the first three days in Nice, and then uh, the ne second three days were in central southern France in Provence, and that's where we're going to spend this evening. And then the last three days were at Montserrat with the the Black Madonna of Montserrat high up in the mountains outside of Barcelona. But I sent this out to all the people coming on the trip ahead of time because I said, this is who we're going to encounter on our trip. And it's a boat and it shows us the legend that John shared with you last week, apparently. But just to refresh you, one of the legends in the early church in France, at least, was that uh, after the ascension, Mary Magdalene and Martha and who, who they thought were sisters, they didn't know that uh, Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene were two different people, most likely. And their brother Lazarus got in a boat along with Maximus. He's the third guy there. And they um, and the rudders, they were put in the boat by in the age of Christian persecution. And the boat didn't have a sail or rudder. And they prayed to the Holy Spirit that wherever you have this boat land is where you want us to be. And it landed on the southern shores of France. And to this day, there's a town, the town of the Maries, where this boat landed. And they all went their separate ways. Le, um, Lazarus became the first bishop of Marseille. Uh, Maximus was a bishop somewhere else, I forget where. And then uh, Mary Magdalene went off her way and became and preached. She's the person, according to the story, who brought uh, the gospel to France for the first time, introduced Christianity to Gaul, as it was called then. And Martha on the right side of the boat in purple. And that's who we celebrate tonight as well. But in the row behind them on this boat, we see Vincent van Gogh and Henry Matisse. Matisse is my favorite modern artist, and he designed a chapel for the Dominican nuns when he was 80 years old, and he considered it the masterpiece of his life. So that's where we visited, the very first thing we visited when the, the group got together. And then we, um, in, the, in the center of France, we, we, is where we're concentrating tonight. And that's also where Van Gogh was in, lived in Arles and where he was in, uh, spent his time in a mental hospital there. And then behind them is Our Lady of Montserrat from, the, uh, from Barcelona. So all the characters, all the spiritual heroes we were gonna meet on this trip are right here in this boat. And you can see the Holy Spirit's holding the anchor steady. Mm. So to refresh, here's Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, and it tells us in John's gospel that Jesus wept. It only tells us twice in, the, in all the four gospels that Jesus wept like that, had that pure human emotion. And so here's Mary and Martha comforting him. And this was inspired, I remember the moment it was inspired when one of my dearest friends in Oblate uh, was killed in a car accident after he had just left dinner with the bishop who was going to ordain him several months later. His name was Eric. And I was at his viewing and uh, it was down at, at Oblate Parish in Virginia. And um, I was hugging his two sisters right by his coffin. And that's where this image came from. I thought Jesus was hugging these two sisters that, that were like sisters to him. And he loved Lazarus dearly. Um, some modern uh, writers and commentators on scripture feel that Lazarus was probably a mentally challenged adult because it would have been the custom in that day for his two sisters to never marry and to stay home and, and take care of him, which I think adds such beauty to the story that maybe Lazarus was a, someone in particular need, and which is why Jesus loved him all the more. But anyhow, here he is being hugged by Mary and Martha, and up top it says, Vita mutater non toliter, which is Latin, from the funeral rite uh, mass, which means life is changed, not ended. So years ago, I did a children's book called Children, uh, Jesus A to Z. And this is the letter M. And it says, Mary and Martha made many meals for the Messiah. 
and everything's an M in here. It starts, it's mismatched furniture at the bottom. There's coffee mugs in the, in the rack. And way up top is a bottle of Merlot for the adult reader of the book. <laughs> and we can tell which one's Mary and which one's Martha because Mary has the iPod in her ear, the little earphones, so that she can listen to Jesus and still get her housework done. And Martha won't get mad at her for not helping her with the housework. So here's the cave on this trip. Once we got to the central part of Southern France, um, we visited Mary Magdalene's cave. And it was high up this hill, very, very high hill. It, was, it took about an hour to climb up there. It was a gravel road, so it was, the surface was easy, but it was a lot of switchback stuff, and it was pretty steep. In fact, some of our group had to stay down below and uh, stay in the museum and coffee shop that they have there. But uh, in any event, we climbed and climbed, and uh, the legend is that she spent the last years of her life up there. You hear varying accounts, but most say it was about the last six years of her life. And she even used to go way up top there. You see that little oratory up on the upper left. And that, um, that's a more modern one that was erected in the Middle Ages. But supposedly it was a spot that she, when she really wanted to get away from it all, uh, uh, that's where she would go up there, climb up there to, to pray. And as we're climbing and climbing and climbing, and I thought, oh, my God, I don't think I can make it. I was, I was that worn out. And you start to see hope. There's the, a corner of a building up there as you're looking upward. And then you get to the top, and there's uh, this beautiful crucifixion tableau right in the, in the cliff. And there's Mary Magdalene to the right of the crucifix there. And um, just when you get to the top and you look around the corner, and there's 120 steps waiting for you. So just when you thought you're finished, you have more steps to climb. But this is the end of the steps right here. And we get inside the cave. And um, it's a beautiful cave, <laughs> um, pure and simple. And I love this story. You know, as the Irish say, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? Who knows that historically if she's lived here. But it, the truth of it is that that's what happens to all of us, hopefully, in our Last year, as we go into that more peaceful, contemplative place, all of us needs a cave to go to. Mine's my studio down in South Camden, and I have spent more time there in the past uh, four months than I have in the 12 years I've lived here, I think. I'm just down there all the time. And that's my little runaway from home place, and we all need one. Uh, my only other one's going to the shop right. And uh, so <laughs> the, the cave gives me a lot more creative opportunity. But it's a really special place. And... Um, there's devotional, there's statues and candles and whatnot. And we had mass there. And here's the young Dominican priest. He had only recently been ordained and he celebrated mass. And while he was doing that, I sketched. And it was so beautiful because we looked into the cave and there was mass and he looked out of the cave and there was all of France out there, you know, the beautiful mountains and hills. And um, it was like the, the inside and the outside coming together, the microcosm and the macrocosm, because many, many saints, including Francis de Sales, had this love for caves. Caves are symbolic of going into the womb of Mother Earth to be reborn and to go into that quiet, silent place. And uh, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the nativity is always depicted happening in a cave. We in the West have always shown the, a manger, you know, in a stable and all that. And in the West, it was, in the East rather, it was always a cave as that symbol of Christ. Of course, God would become incarnate in the very depths of the earth and the bowels of the earth. So there's some beautiful symbolism in there. And it all came alive in a whole new way. Well, Martha went the other direction. Mar Mary Magdalene, by the way, is the patron saint of preachers because of uh, preaching the word. And as I always love to point out, ain't that ironic that in a church where women can't preach, they have a patron saint of preachers, but it's the same church that has a man as the patron saint of childbirth. So <laughs> go figure, you know, um, so things get a little crazy sometimes, don't they? But here uh, is Martha. And the story has it that she was wandering around preaching, bringing, bringing the good news. And um, she came across a dragon, a very, very fierce dragon from mythology, Gallic mythology, and his name was Therese, T-A-R-E-S-C-E. -E. And we've all seen pictures of St. Michael stabbing, the, you know, standing on the serpent, or St. George stabbing the dragon with his uh, sword. Well, that's a, the manly approach to things, just kill it, get it out of the way. Martha took a more feminine and spiritual approach, 
and she preached the good news to the dragon. And she told the dragon about Christ over there on the left, raising her brother from the dead, and that her life changed. And that that's what we see in John's gospel, John 11, when she tells Jesus, you are the Messiah, you know. Um, and so that calmed the dragon down. And it gentled that dragon just through her gentleness and love. And it went back into town and the people didn't realize that she had tamed it and they killed the dragon. And when she told them what that happened, they, there was such remorse that they decided to name their town after him. So to this day, the town is called Tarasson, T-A-R-A-S-C-O-N. And uh, that's where her, there's a basilica there with her remains. We'll see that in a minute. One of the women on my trip, a dear friend, she lives in Denver, but she um, came on the trip and her name's Martha. So all day I was telling everybody on the bus, you know, when we were going around, this is Martha's day. It's, uh, you know, we're going to St. Martha's shrine and whatnot. So we all had to make a fuss over Martha. And when we got home, I wasn't home a month when I got an email from her asking for permission to have my picture of, made into a tattoo. <laughs> she really wanted the whole thing, at least the whole right side of the picture there of Martha and the dragon. But her tattoo guy apparently couldn't figure out how to make something so big on her. So she ended up just getting this wrist tattoo. And I think that's so cool. It's the first time that ever happened with my art that I know of. So I always say, if this doesn't work out what I'm doing now, there's a future in tattoo artistry perhaps waiting <laughs> for me. I can start a, a business of holy tattoos. <laughs> But uh, I love that. And look at that smile on her face. She's great. So anyhow, here's the Romanesque Basilica that is the, um, the, the, the houses, the, the remains, according to pious tradition, of St. Martha. And we can see it's Romanesque because it's you know, very, um, unlike a Gothic cathedral, which is soaring and thin and more uh, feminine, this is more, more military. You know, it looks like a fortress. It's very thick walls and squat, beautiful uh, sculptures inside and all that, but uh, not uh, terribly attractive on the outside. Looks, you know, more uh, like a like a battle fortress or something than it does a church. But you go inside and then there's uh, the relics of St. Martha in that reliquary there behind a grate. You can't get into it, but I did sneak a picture through the, through the grate. Uh, her, Mary Magdalene's remains are also in a Gothic church at the town beneath her shrine. And um, we were told that they've done DNA tests on that skull. On, and it, it is the skull of a woman from the Middle East from around the time of Christ. So who knows, maybe it really was Mary Magdalene. And uh, I don't know what parts of <laughs> Martha are in there. I don't know if it's her skull or what, but there she is. So I just want to show you in that time period how the art was, you know, because this whole sense of dragons was very, very real to people and the devil. And uh, the devil was as real as, as anything else, you know, anything that went wrong, any physical ailment you had, any mental disability, anything that went wrong with your crops, anything um, was always uh, blamed on the presence of the devil. So it was a very, very real presence. And often they would sculpt things like this. This is the capital of a column. This is in the Philadelphia Art Museum. But um, look at that funny face. They would do things like this to make fun of the devil too, to show we're not scared of you. We're just going to make you look silly and goofy. And that was often the case. These are very famous capitals in, a, in Autun, France. And, um, but you can see on the right there, the devil just having their way with that guy hanging him from it. I think that's Judas actually, now that I think of it, uh, who hung himself after betraying Christ. But it's the devil's pulling on the noose, right? And on the left, we see the devil's uh, weighing souls in the balance. And here's a classic statue of St. Michael, also from the Philadelphia Museum, standing on the serpent at the bottom there. So ever since uh, Adam and Eve and the serpent, and uh, that, that just became such a rich part of the mythology of all the way up through the, up to modern times, I guess, basically, people believed in these kinds of creatures, serpents and dragons. And Eve got sucked into all that. There's a very, very famous sculpture. I forgot to put the actual photo in this is my sketch of it but it's eve um and she's holding a what some people feel is a pomegranate not an apple because they're symbolic of mary's breastfeeding jesus every everything in nature had a symbol back in the day but um uh, my great mentor in art and faith always said this was his favorite sculpture in all of art history because he said that face said it all he said it wasn't 
it was so often used as an anti-woman thing. You know, Eve always appears in art and theology uh, to put down all women. But this is more universal than that, he said. You know, it's the face of the human reality of, oh my God, what have I done? I know better than this. And it's the things that we all do all our lives. You know, we have these moments of what was I, what did I do? You know, how can I ever be forgiven for saying that or doing that? And that's what um, this artist captured in Eve's face there. So here's some gargoyles that I sketched last year at the Cologne Cathedral on the outside of the cathedral. Gargoyles were used, they're primarily drain spouts that was to let the water out and get it off the roof of the, uh, the buildings. But they just decided to have a little fun with them. Some of them are very comical. Some are fierce looking, uh, all kinds of uh, creatures and critters there. But you can see they look like science fiction uh, characters, don't they? Um, out of a like a Game of Thrones or something. St. Cyril of Jerusalem said this, the dragon sits by the side of the road. Beware, lest he devour you. We go to the father of souls, but it's necessary to pass by the dragon. And I just love that quote. It's so much um, wisdom in there that that's the, the mystery of life right in there, that we have to go through our tough times. And it's what we do with the tough times that every one of us, has the deaths and griefs and losses and the um, the things that happened to us that we didn't ask for. It's what do we do with that 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 defines our character and helps us get closer to God. You know, if we we find um, strength to get through it through God and courage and faith, all those beautiful ca ca characteristics that we need that we can't get until we encounter the dragon. So St. Hildegard of Bingen um, had vision. She composed music. She was this brilliant, brilliant figure. And this is my iPad sketch version of uh, one of her paintings that shows how creation came about. The head at the top is God the Father. And then the figure in red is Christ, as a Christ figure um, with the sheep, as, you know, of course, the good shepherd. But it's also for her the personification of love, which is what Christ was, that the power and energy of love that fills the universe. And dwelling on that rather than sin and evil and punishment and judgment is, is what's so important because look what he's doing. He's standing on Adam who's fallen asleep with the serpent wrapped around him at the bottom. So it's this, the whole idea that love is wins in the end. You know, and that's true of our personal battles uh, with the dragon as well as our um, communal ones and social ones. St. Teresa of Avila's famous prayer says this, let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patience obtains all things. The one who has God has everything. God is sufficient. That's a beautiful prayer. It's been you know, greatly loved by people ever since her time. And nobody even knew she wrote it. She had it written on a slip of paper and it was found in her office book after she died. But now um, it's, I've, I've done several versions of it when I, when I need to be reminded of that. Don't be frightened. Don't be scared. You're not alone. Uh, God's always with you. She said, I don't fear Satan as much as I fear those who fear him. <laughs> and that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? That sometimes um, you know, people can be real creepy and it's been cranky. And especially when they hide behind religion, what they think is the point of religion and become judgmental and creepy and um, ugly, you know, violence done in the name of Jesus, racism, uh, all of it, you know, it's just kind of, it's, and, and that's what Teresa was talking about there, that um, it's, Satan's, it's not Satan, it's, it's the people who, out of fear of Satan, act out in the most awful and vicious ways. There's an old Irish proverb, go to the place of your greatest fear, and there you will find your greatest strength. And that makes, that's another one that I, I just love. As soon as I read it, I thought I have to make a picture of that. With the serpent there, there he is, uh, or she. <laughs> and um, and it's, it's in those moments, it's, it's, it says, I said, if we approach them correctly, we find our strength in there and a reason to move on. St. Francis de Sales said, have courage and turn troubles you cannot fix into material for progress and maturity. Learn to embrace your cross. That's another Salesian um, maxim. And uh, one of my favorites of his, make friends with your trials. 
And that's the best we can do. It's like sit down and, and teach me, you know, rather than running in fear from it or trying to suppress your trials and fears, that's when they turn into alcoholism or addictions or compulsive behaviors or things that, uh, like the Eve picture, things that we know better that we shouldn't be doing. But that's what happens when we try to repress or bury or ignore what so Francis de Sales tells us, sit down and learn from, teach me, you know? And that's kind of a really modern psychological element. He was so ahead of his time and it makes sense, you know, just, uh, just teach me and, and make, I'll make friends with this trial and we'll move on. He said that with the exception of sin, anxiety is the worst thing that can happen to a soul because people can get themselves so caught up in anxiety, it's crippling for some, for some people. I know some people, anxiety medicine, and um, it's, it's so painful to watch. And um, he said that it's a, such a distraction. It is kind of like the work of the devil. If the devil knows how to uh, work his way into people's lives by filling them with anxiety and doubt. And it's um, people that are filled with anxiety or, you know, it's time to get the guns out and be prepared and uh, overreact to things and just live in fear, be afraid of change, afraid of transforming and moving forward. They just want to keep things the way they've always been because of the security of it. And that's not how the Holy Spirit rolls. The Holy Spirit, as I always say, does not fly backwards. <laughs> you know, and we, get, we can't just keep clinging to the familiar and the old. We have to trust in every age that the, the Holy Spirit's leading us forward. And we're all together in this. We're not alone. So another thing to say, I'll say is ignore the barking of the dogs and keep going. And this quote starts off with, um, he said, we have a lot of lessons to learn from traveling salesmen who, when they uh, are out on the road, doing their work and they encounter uh, barking dogs. That's what he said. They just learn to ignore the barking of the dogs and keep going. And that's what we need to do, you know, and for him, I, I translate this anyhow as being the, the barking dogs are the dragons that uh, previous generations would have talked about. You know, it's, it's those um, scary, annoying things that kind of keep us uh, fearful. St. Elizabeth Seaton, she's one of my favorites. When I lived in Washington, I used to Every occasionally drive up to Emmitsburg, Maryland, where her she's buried, her tomb is there, and that's where she lived and spent her years. Um, and whenever I needed help, I'd say, come on, Betty Ann, I need your help, and I'd drive on up there. And uh, it's just below Gettysburg. And she, um, but she said this, we must be careful to meet our grace. If mine depends on going to a place to which I have the most dreadful aversion, in that place, is a state of grace waiting for me. I love that. It makes such sense. If you think, look at the things that you dread more than anything, and I have a lot of that these days. I'm sure we all do, but some days I just get a knot in my stomach. Just watching the news sometimes is enough to do that. And um, But then I just have to remember, you know, it's it, we got to stay with the Holy Spirit here and, and work together at building this new world that's struggling to emerge clearly instead of cowering in fear from it, because that's not going to help anything or anybody. And that's what the Elizabeth Seton was saying. You know, there's grace in that fear. And uh, you can't get to the grace until you encounter the fear and make friends with it. Um, I, Martin Luther said, uh, if you're going to sin, sin big. <laughs> he got in a lot of trouble for that. But because uh, the idea being that you're going to get the same forgiveness from God whether it's a little, so you might as well enjoy it kind of idea. You know, people often interpret it that way. But there's, you know, there's some elements to truth in these things. Thomas Merton said, in the desert, one does not fight rattlesnakes. One simply lives with them and gets out of the way. <laughs> I like that. And then since you're right out there, I had to share this. On one of my first visits out there, I asked John to please take me up to Bodega Bay. When I was a little kid, The Birds was one of my, the Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds was one of my favorite movies. I saw it a million times. And to this day, I haven't seen it in a little while, but I would love to see it again. But um, up in Bodega Bay is where it was filmed. And there's that little lunch shop there. We stopped and had lunch. And there's the statue of Alfred out front. And, um, 
and Tippy Hedren on the right there with them birded up in her wig. And I think that's one of her actual outfits from the movie. But in any event, it was just a fun place to go. And I just throw this in here for fun, not only because, not only because it's in your neighborhood, uh, kind of, but um, it's, it's a, a modern way that we deal with our, our fears and anxieties through the medium of film. You know, with, that's what horror movies are all about or any or thrillers of any kind. It's kind of um, to help us touch that place inside of us that, that has fear and to kind of move on. So that's healthy. Go watch, the, go rent the birds and watch it. One of my favorite spiritual writers is a friend of John's and mine uh, now and up there in, down in San Francisco, Dave Rico. I love his books. He's a Jungian therapist and um, he just, his work just makes such sense. And this is from one of his books, Faith is Based on Imagination, Not Intellect. And that's what we've been looking at. That's what dragons are about and, and all the great art over time that helps us look at fear. It's all from the imagination. The intellect, we can't make black and white surety of God. God is mystery. And too many theologians have tried to do that over years. And we turn God into a black and white this is how it is, and you can't divorce, diverge from that. And um, they're all people are the same, you know. The uniformity is uh, that, which is how most of us were raised in the church, right? Um, don't ask questions, be nice, just go to work, mass every Sunday, and that's what makes you a good Catholic. And that's not how people roll anymore. Um, we need to get into our imaginations more and love who you are personally, right? And uniquely made in the image and likeness of God, and you're okay. There's nothing you can do, nothing to separate you from God's love. So um, I'm always telling people, grow up, you know, just if you still have this relationship with God, that's like the one you learned about in sixth grade, then it's time to move on because God doesn't want to keep you trapped in that scared little kid, you know, afraid of breaking the rules mode. That's, that's not freeing. And that's what religion is supposed to free us and unite us. So Pope Paul VI also said, it's beauty like truth, which brings joy to the heart. So while we're down in that southern part of France, I, can't, I have to share our images of Vincent van Gogh, who's an artist who probably more than any other artist in modern times, or at least most famously, um, dealt with his dragons through creating beauty. And as we all know, he had a whole history, a lifetime of mental distress. He was born with a lot of it. He, uh, his father was a very, very stern pastor in the uh, Dutch Reformed Church. And he and his wife had a baby uh, who they adored, who died several years after birth. And that baby's name was Vincent. And several years later, this Vincent was born and they named him Vincent. And um, they never liked him. They were, always gave him his, his father. He was never good enough for his father. And so he grew up in this household where he was trying to measure up to this brother he'd never know who had died whose shadow he lived in and that contributed to the other mental distress and disorders that he had going on and he was a very difficult person people he was the type of person they say it would go the other way on the street if you saw him coming because you just couldn't deal with it and so um a sad soul but a very gentle kind person for the most part and he um took up pain, he entered the seminary in an attempt to please his father. And it was a disaster. And it, they, there was a year of service in the middle of seminary when all, all seminarians had to do a, a year of service somewhere. And he chose to go to an area called the Bourinage, which was the poorest area in all of Europe. And it was on the border between Holland and Belgium. It was the coal mining country, desperate poverty and horrible, horrible conditions and poor health and all the people going down into the mines and anyhow he felt and this is in 1880-ish um, uh, he felt that that's where Christ would be found in the modern world that that the, not in the comfortable white privileged churches you know it was it would be in the most desperate place and the powers that be in his church just couldn't get that they thought he was nuts for wanting to do this they wanted him in the white privileged uh clean and neat and tidy uh, churches of, of Holland. And so he was kicked out of the seminary, he never made it. And he made the statement, I didn't put the picture in, I don't think, but he said, um, <coughs> I believe that God of the clergyman is as dead as a doornail. And he never lost his faith in God. And he and later in life had painted the parables in modern form. And he just always loved Christ. But he said the institutional church is missing it. And that's why he's so important today 
my art and faith mentor, who I mentioned earlier, used to call him St. Vincent. And it was, he said that he, uh, he had the spiritual death that so many of the other modern artists didn't. But modern artists felt shut out by the church because they said they didn't want anything to do with modernism in any form. No science, no evolution or Darwinism. You know, everything was outlawed in the church at this period. So Vincent van Gogh, I think, in that sense, was pointing us to the mindset of the 20th century when people are saying more than ever in history, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I think that's part of the struggle we're in these days. It's to bring spirituality and religion back together again, or spirituality and theology, you could say, um, uh, because they've become so people don't trust the institutional churches as much, but they're desperate. They're longing for a relationship with God. Our former cat past our bishop rather passed on last year, wonderful man named Joe Galante. And he always used to say, the problems we're facing in the church today are our own creation, meaning the hierarchy. He said, because we always went out of our way to make sure everybody knew their catechism answers and questions and the do's and the don'ts and, you know, just show up every Sunday, don't ask questions, be nice. And he said, but we never taught them how to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And he said, that's what people want more than anything. And to that end, he said, I think that adult faith formation is so much more important even than children's faith formation. Because he said, the kids aren't getting it at home. So you have to educate the adults so that they pass it on to the kids in the home. And I think there's such wisdom in there. And that, that's kind of a long way. I didn't plan on talking about any of that, but that's where Van Gogh was headed back in 1890 when he uh, said these things. He said, um, what am I in the eyes of most people, a non-entity or an eccentric or a disagreeable man, someone who has no position in society? In short, a little lower than the lowest. I would like to show what's in the heart of such an eccentric, such a nobody. He wanted his art to be ministry, to reach out to people who felt they were in the margins of society or unacceptable to the norm, to the status quo, to the comfortable bourgeois world, you know, that there are some, most people don't fit neat into those neat and tidy circles. And that's who we wanted to show. He said, I want to show what's in the heart of someone like that. And it was truly ministry to him. He felt he was showing the presence of Christ through that. And he didn't want his, he was furious when his brother sold one of his paintings. The only one painting in his entire life was sold. Um, by his brother who was an art dealer and the only person he felt close to. They were very, very close. Um, in fact, Vincent Van wrote, wrote, wrote many letters to him. His brother's name was Theo. And um, he would write in these letters, uh, detailed accounts of what he painted that day. So that's how we know so much about his artwork because he, he would tell Theo in these letters. And Theo just felt the, he would send him money once in a while. He's the only person that could send money uh, to him for art supplies and to keep him going in paint and uh, to pay his rent at the various places. So he, they was re he really depended on Theo. And it was after his death that Theo's widow, um, that she, she didn't like Vincent either, but she knew her husband, how much her husband loved him, uh, his brother. Um, and she took his, all Van Gogh's paintings around to art dealers in Paris. And she's the one that we probably wouldn't know Van Gogh today if it weren't for, for her. Anyhow, all that aside, he, when he had his most, the biggest major breakdown, the one where he famously cut off his ear and all that, um, he was taken to this hospital in Saint Remy, a beautiful, quaint, and lovely, lovely little town uh, that we spent three days in. And we walked over from our hotel to this uh, hospital, which is in the exact same condition it was when Van Gogh went there in 1889. And these are the front gates of it. And um, it was, um, it's now a museum for the most part, but it's still a, a mental facility institution or hospital, um, but in a more modern building off to the side. We never even saw that. But in Vincent's day, it was run by an order of nuns. It had been a um, monastery in the Middle Ages. So it's built like a monastery structure. As we'll see, it had a cloister garden in the middle and everything. And the Order of Nuns, when they sold it to this other private firm, um, they adopted as their ministry. A lot of those sisters are now art therapists as a result of having Van Gogh in this hospital. Because this is one of his paintings of that. And here's the entrance and uh, how it looked in his day with, this, with the tree right there, cypress tree, I guess. And here's the back end of it. Uh, his cell or room was the one 
I believe it. Um, and it's, it's on that wall anyhow, but I think it's the one to the right of the trees up there on the second floor. And you can, um, you, you can visit that hallway and, and his cell. And also across from it, they have some of the devices that they used. This is before psychiatry and psychology, or at least they were very, very new sciences that nobody knew much about yet. Um, so they had all kinds of awful treatments that it would subject people to. But um, here's my sketch of the backyard with lavender growing there in the field. That's one of our, uh, the women in our group walking by there with her cane. And it was just so awesome. I'd been dreaming of seeing this place for years because this is where Van Gogh encountered his dragons in the most uh, creative way. And look who I ran into back there. There's Mary Olwen. <laughs> and uh, we sat down on that bench in that, in that garden there. Lovely. So here's the cloister garden. And this is what it, um, this is where it became his favorite place to be because he always loved painting flowers. And um, they noticed, one of his attendants noticed that when he was drawing, when they let him draw, that he was starting to show improvement and he was healing from his mental distress. And so the, that, that attendant went to the um, director of the hospital and he said, I notice he's doing better. He said, I'd like to suggest that we create a studio space for him. And so they gave him his own place to paint and study. And he started improving in leaps and bounds. And um, what you see on the walls there are artwork from, I didn't unfortunately have enough time to look, but what I saw of them, they were beautiful. But these were all the art pieces of people who were staying there, patients uh, in their art therapy sessions, created the paintings that are now hanging around the cloister garden walls there. And that's our group there. Um, after we had finished our tour. And it's a classic uh, monastic enclosure, kind of a cloister garden, uh, which is very healing to begin with, let alone what it's for in his, what it was for in his day. And there's looking down on it from the second floor. So it's to have this, these little moments of beauty that helped at least Vincent, I don't know what it did for everybody else there, but uh, it was helping him heal. And so I, I did, this is my sketch of it. I did it in pen and ink and then painted it later. But notice I took the ceilings out and um, the roof rather, and you can see the stars beyond. And this is one of the paintings he did there of the irises that were in the garden. This is in the Seattle Art Museum now. Um, by the way, the one painting that was sold by his brother secretly, I forget what it went for in that day, but it was just uh, sold again several years ago. I think it was $94 million, <laughs> just unbelievable. Um, for somebody who didn't want to make a lot of money off his work, he just wanted it to help people. And this is a beautiful image of irises. Um, he loved all flowers, but irises were among his favorite and sunflowers were his ultimate favorite because they reminded him of hope and the sun. And he said, I wish they could just accept me as I am. I draw not to annoy people, but to amuse them or to make them aware of things which are worth looking at and which not everyone knows about. I just want to draw their attention to the little things, the ordinary, you know? So here's his cell that he was in. And um, these are the barred windows that if it was from this cell that he painted Starry Night, his greatest masterpiece. That he didn't do that on site. He did it from inside there. So here he is with the walls again broken and the, of the cloister and he's seeing the stars. He's becoming obsessed with the night sky uh, as a symbol of his own internal night and the darkness and fear, but how stars fill it with hope. There's always stars to look at. And he said, be clearly aware of the stars and infinity on high. Then life seems almost enchanted after all. And he said, I don't know anything with certainty, but seeing the stars makes me dream. He wrote to his brother, I'll take up my pencil that I put down in discouragement and I'll get back into drawing. Now I'm on my way and my pencil has become quite compliant and becomes more so day by day. So this is his hope. This was what the Holy Spirit sent him to, to, him, to hang in there. Ignore the barking dogs. Keep going. I've given you this talent. You can use it. Everybody out there has talent, you know, of some kind that's particular to you. And that's why you have it, to help you confront your dragons. So here's the, the yard of the place, the fields that um, once he started doing so well in that little studio, they said, you can go out into the fields and paint 
on site. Um, as long as you have an attendant with you. So as long as somebody was accompanying him, he would go out and paint. And they have signs in the in the ground at these places with posters on them of the paintings that he did on that spot. And so um, I don't remember if this was the exact spot, but I think it is. Um, uh, of these were the olive trees that were growing in that grove. And you can see the mountains in the distance and the sun radiating around. He also did seems at this time of the sower and the seed, the stories of the, and the Good Samaritan, all the stories from the gospel that he always loved. Um, here's my version of that backyard. And oop, I, we already saw that one. And then he did this, his masterpiece. This was just recently named one of the 10 most um, well-known paintings in all of art history along with the Mona Lisa and the Sistine Chapel. Uh, this is right up there. Everybody around the world knows Starry Night. You know, we all know the song too, beautiful song. Um, and it shows his, it's, it's his memories of the child, the town he grew up in, in Holland. And so it's totally out of his imagination. He wasn't basing it on anything right in front of him. And it's the church steeple dominating, as you can see, symbolic of probably the world he grew up in, in church. And the cypress trees are there. Uh, they're linking heaven and earth and like tongues of fire, like the Holy Spirit, you know, the shapes of them. But it was customary in France and Spain and Italy back in the day around cemeteries to build, uh, to plant um, cypress trees because of the shape. It was a symbol of the soul leaving earth and going to heaven, you know, and, and, and heaven and earth all joining together in that beautiful shape. And then the sky is filled with stars, the starry night. And you can see that what those cloud-like shapes in the center, which many analysts re, um, read into as his longing. He was desperate for intimate relationship. He, he just never could keep any, he had no relationships except his brother that were in any way intimate or loving because he just drove everybody away. Paul Gauguin, the other great artist that uh, lived with him for a little while um, and things started off real good in, in Arl, um, uh, but then before you know it, Vincent uh, just had his episodes and they had a vicious fight where they hitting each other and Gauguin left in the middle of the night and went to Tahiti <laughs> where he's famous for painting. And Van Gogh, uh, that's the night he cut off his ear and brought it to a 15-year-old prostitute that he used to like to uh, frequent, frequently visit. But so that's what we see here, this longing for companionship and friendship. So we're going to end um, with this uh, quote of his. It's good to believe that everything is full of wonder, to remain sensitive, lowly, and meek of heart. And here he is with the sunflowers linked with the sky above and the stars above and how we're all connected. That's what Lakota, Native American spirituality, Hildegard of Bingen, ancient Irish spirituality, they all say the same thing, that we're all connected. We're all made uh, by one creator, God. So he died in 1890, the very year that St. Therese of Lisieux, at the age of 15, entered the Carmelite Monastery and up in the northern part of France, which is very beautiful as well. And she once said, if you are willing to serenely bear the trial of being displeasing to yourself, then you will be a pleasant place of shelter for Jesus. And I just love that thought. I think that's what Van Gogh was doing in his own way. Just, uh, you know, I don't know how much serene <laughs> with serenity was going on, but um, he took the moments of being displeasing to himself and found ways to turn them into beauty so that others could do that for themselves. And that's how we make shelters in our hearts for Jesus to, you know, to just accept the fullness of you and, 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 not, and, and move, always move forward. And then with John Lewis, I was so captivated watching everything I could about him the last days. What a hero, great Christian gentleman, um, truly Christian. I was so moved to hear the things that he said and did that were so Christ-like, but also an American patriot who, who made the statement that we're finally in this age of civil rights, making uh, the Declaration of Independence true for everybody, you know, and it's finally coming to fruition. So I love this line that we've been hearing a lot these last couple of days, never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And I love that because Pope Francis has said the same thing several times, uh, go out and make some noise, he told teenagers in, in Brazil when he was there. 
And he said, go home and make noise and don't be afraid if it upsets your bishops and your pastors. Because he said, you're, you're, he's telling young people, you're the generation that can make change that needs to happen. And he said to them last year, um, we older people haven't always um, done well by you. So it's up to you young people to, to make things happen. So Pope Francis also said this, today amid so much darkness, we need to see a light of hope and to be men and women who bring hope to others, to protect creation, to protect every man and woman, to look upon them with tenderness and love, is to open up a horizon of hope. It is to let a shaft of light break through the heavy clouds. And the most famous prayer of the 20th century, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And lastly, we have to end with sunflowers for Vincent and thought from St. Francis de Sales, and who said that uh, patience will bring you perpetual peace and tranquility. And I'm learning more and more as I get older and hopefully wiser that patience is the key to everything. And these days of being sequestered and staying in and are uh, teaching me patience and what's the hurry, <laughs> you know. Um, I, was, I always lived my life at such a manic pace, always racing to the next thing and having 14 things going at once. And now it's not, no, that's important. I'm learning to slow down, do one thing at a time and uh, we're all getting there together. So, I'm going to end there, and um, I'll, should I stop share screen? And do, do we take questions, John? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Maybe. Okay. Let me hit stop share. There. Well, we're glad you uh, took the time to uh, add us to your busy list and busy schedule, um, because this gives us a opportunity in these troubled times to. Uh, slow down ourselves and uh, look at the world through the eyes of beauty, but also through the eyes of people who struggled a lot, like uh, Van Gogh. Um, this week, I, my message in the, in the parish message was about courage, that it takes courage uh, to live every day in ordinary circumstances. So certainly in these trying times, uh, we all need to be uh, courageous and heroic and not, uh, not let the barking dogs get us down, yeah. not let the dragons dominate our hearts inside uh, and outside. And that gift of patience, uh, you know, those who do go to confession, which is the rare Catholic these days, uh, but that's one of the biggest things I hear people say, you know, bless me, Father, I've sinned. I, I've been so impatient with my kids, or I've been uh. so impatient with my wife you know, uh, yeah. and, and patience is that great inner gift. And um, I love that um, when you, when we talked about this and with St. Martha, that Martha and Mary Magdalene are in that same region where Van Gogh had his healing. You know, it's kind of, it's like one of those spiritual nerve centers of, of, of France that there's some of that healing energy going on there, you know? Um, so Martha, it was the perfect day to celebrate the, dragons helping us deal with our dragons the pictures uh, that we looked at last week uh, were some of the nature scenes from uh, the Côte d'Azur and the uh, the whole area of southern France the Camargue with the white stallions running wild and the fields of fields of lavender that go on mm. for acres and acres I said who wouldn't want to be stranded uh, yeah, <laughs> on a boat. Me. That's right. <laughs> take me, take me. There are worse um, things. Huh? <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if Sandy uh, Gritzer, would you unmute yourself and uh, let us know about the food collection uh, this Sunday, please? Thank you, Father. I just want to let everyone know this Sunday, uh, between uh, twelve thirty and two thirty, Outreach is having a food uh, collection that will benefit St. Vincent de Paul uh, food pantry. And you, and it's a drive just like we had for Monument Crisis. You just drive up and uh, open your trunk or open the side door and outreach members will come in and take the, um, the food and we'll take it over to St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, they're asking for, just real quick, they're asking for corn or canola oil, spaghetti, pasta sauce, 
plastic jars, please. Uh, chicken noodle soup, canned fruit, peaches and pineapple, canned corn, unsweetened cereal, oatmeal, graham crackers, and paper grocery bags, please. They need those as well to repack the food and, and distribute it. Um, and if you, you could come after, uh, if you're coming up for, for the Eucharist after the 1130 Mass, you can drop off. It'll be in the upper lot by the, by the office. It'll, that's, that's where there'll be, uh, there'll be, there'll be uh, signs up pointing you in that direction. So if you can just drive by and, and probably after 1030, you could probably just leave the food up there. There won't be anybody there, but, but uh, you could probably just drop it off at that point if you're going to, uh, if you're going to, then you won't have to come back later. So thank you. And thanks, Sandy. And thanks to you and your helpers <clears throat> for getting food to people. We know that all the shelters are in a greater need than ever uh, during these days. I have some of those things on your list if you want me to ship it out to you. <laughs> but well, once again, Mickey, uh, thanks so much for being with us. It's encouraging, uh, it's inspiring, and uh, the, uh, the breadth of your, uh, your knowledge and uh, wisdom, especially in the insight into the great artists um, of our uh, century and, be and beyond uh, can bring us a lot of inspiration, as does all of your illustrations. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and we'll do it again, right? We will. <laughs>